would be good. I often forget to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. What do you think? Yeah, we can get started. Rama, if you want to kick it off. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Basaratha Rama. I'm a professor at Florida International University and also a parent of an autistic adult. So I met, uh, you know, I came across Dr. Cabrera's work more than 15 years ago. So it's been part of our lives for a very long time. Uh, we started using it with Anant when he was in elementary school and uh, we still use it. So I think there's a, what I call a parent advantage because we can use it for an extended period of time. Uh, have a sort of a uh, experience both on the parent side and the professor side and definitely more successful as a parent because you can use it for such a long period of time. So that's my personal journey. So just a few words about Dr. Cabrera's. Uh, Dr. Derek Cabrera is an internationally known system scientist. Uh, he's a faculty on, uh, of Cornell University. He's a faculty director for the graduate certification program in systems thinking, modeling, and leadership, and is a senior scientist at Cabrera Research Lab. His work in public schools was documented in the full-length documentary film, Rethinking. He's an author of 10 books, including Systems Thinking Made Simple and Thinking at Every Desk. Uh, he was founder and chief scientific officer of Plectica, since sold to Frameable. Uh, he, is, he was awarded the Association of American Colleges and Universities K. Patricia Cross Future Educational Leaders Award. Prior to becoming a scientist, he worked for 15 years as a mountain guide an experiential educator for Outward Bound. He worked extensively with the Conservation Corps and Restorative Justice Movements. He holds a PhD from Cornell University and lives in Ithaca with his wife, uh, Laura Cabrera, three children and four dogs. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's, that struck me. Dr. Laura Cabrera currently teaches systems thinking, modeling and systems leadership at Cornell University at the Institute of Policy Affairs. She's also the program director for Cornell's graduate certification program in systems thinking, modeling, and leadership. She serves as the faculty for SC Johnson College of Business, where she delivers executive education programs to executive teams in both systems thinking and systems leadership. She's co-founder and chief research officer at Cabrera Research Lab. She was co-founder and chief research officer of Plectica. Uh, she has applied her expertise in research methods and translational research to increase public understanding, practical application, and dissemination of sophisticated system science and systems thinking model. In 2018, she received the National Science Foundation Small Business Innovation Research for her work in cognitive mapping. She has more than 25 years of research and teaching experience at Cornell, which includes teaching coursework on families and social policy in Cornell's Department of Human Development, Senior Research Associate at Center for Translational Research. She's a co-principal investigator for Cornell's Parenting in Context Initiative. She's a member of the United States Military Academy at West Point's Systems Engineering Advisory Board. She specializes in translating cutting edge research from learning sciences for broad application, whether in corporations, schools, nonprofits, or for parents interested in psychosocial development of their children. So welcome, Dr. Derek Cabrera and Dr. Laura Cabrera. We are very pleased to have you here. And hopefully, we can take uh, DSRP more to India. You know, have a, I run a group for parents, and many of them are from India. So also uh, neurodiverse learners, that's my other emerging interest. So welcome. And I still remember our old think blocks, the magnetic ones. Yes. <laughs> so we started way back. Yes. yes. Those magnets <laughs> caused so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> they were great. They were fun, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rama, for um, for setting us up and, and uh, get, getting us to do this. Uh, this is, uh, as parents, 
And as, as somebody on the uh, not neurotypical uh, spectrum, uh, these are both things that are dear to my heart. So um, uh, I appreciate you setting it up for, for today. And we'll be recording this so that uh, people can watch it afterward. And it's going to be a pretty informal session. Uh, we appreciate you, you know, joining in on Saturday. So if you have a question, just uh, speak out, turn on, turn on your mic and speak out. And we're happy to answer questions or provide examples or whatever. It'll be pretty informal for the next 40 minutes. Um, That's true. Yeah? That's your story. Should we get started? Let's get started. All right. Just to give you a tiny bit of background, Laura and I teach, um, we teach a bunch of courses at Cornell, but the two basic uh, courses are, are um, systems thinking and mapping, which is the kind of the bottom two gray things. And then that, that kind of gets at the individual uh, uh, person. And, uh, and then when we take systems thinking into organizations, we teach systems leadership, which is how do you do system stuff at the organizational level? And one of the great joys that we have is we get to teach to a really broad range of people. I mean, we, we teach uh, kindergartners, we teach third graders, we teach eighth graders, we teach parents, we teach executives of the biggest companies in the world. We teach graduate students at Cornell. Uh, we teach you know, military folks, special forces, uh, pro professional athletes, you name it. We get to, we get to uh, work with a, a, just a really great diversity of, of folks and um, and they all apply the exact same things. I mean, we really only teach uh, two things, VMCL and DSRP. So um, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone that simple. secret. But, <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's great to see the same ideas being being implemented and su people succeeding in so many different diverse areas. Um, and, uh, and, and those two big areas are captured in our books, Systems Thinking Made Simple, which is about systems thinking and Flock Not Clock, which is about systems leadership. And, and so we'll start it off with just a, a simple question, which is, have we got thinking all wrong? Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, we're told that thinking is a stepwise process, uh, which it, it really is not a stepwise process. We're, we're told that thinking is a static hierarchical process, which it also is not. Um, we're told that thinking is kind of a mechanical process. The metaphor that you see is always gears in the head, right? Uh, and, and of course, the brain is nothing like gears and the brain is nothing like a computer. We say all the time, the brain is like a computer, but the mind and the brain really is nothing like a computer. A computer is kind of a cold calculating binary box of plastic and metal built by engineers and the brain is a um, and the mind is a, a three pound uh, mass of fleshy and folded soft tissue uh, water and fats comprising 112 billion non neurons and close to 90 billion neurons connected to a network of sensory nerve tissues which make up the mind uh, that's connected to the brain which is the body and all our sensory apparatus and all that kind of stuff. So it really, you know, these, these metaphors we use and these models that we use of thinking are, are not really uh, mechanical processes or linear processes or stepwise processes. And so one wonders, um, you know, you wouldn't, unless you were a collector or something, you probably wouldn't go buy a 70 year old car uh, you'd, you'd buy a new car. And yet we're, we're still using really old and outdated models of thinking. Um, and, and I, you know, frankly, it's, it's part of what we do is to try to update people's models of thinking, because we know a lot more today than we knew 50 years ago, or even 20 years ago about how the mind works. And so the other piece that I'd love to sort of hit on is, um, is kind of what, what does thinking do? That's a question that is critically important because thinking is, a, is the process we use to solve problems, to invent all inventions, to innovate all innovations, to create all new things. Um, you know, that might, at first you'd think, oh yeah, wait a minute, that, that's right. Like all the new things we create, all the innovations, all the inventions, all the successes we have, thinking is, is absolutely core to learning. 
Uh, and learning, of course, is essential to any success in, at, in, in any dimension of life. When there's no tool, when an engineer has no tool to use, when the problem solver has no framework to use, when there's no solution, when no one else has yet to solve the problem, when there are no answers, when there's no one around to help us solve the problem that we're trying to solve, thinking is the tool that we use. So sometimes we, we're so used to thinking that we, we give it short shrift. We don't really think about how critically important thinking is, um, but it, it really is critically important. Um, it, uh, you know, that's an, even that's an understatement. So uh, just to put thinking in context a little bit, you might have also heard about um, uh, Daniel Kahneman's work. He talks about there's really two modes of thinking, system one and system two thinking. Um, system one is the one we use 95% of the time. It's fast, it's intuitive, it's emotional, it's automatic. And it only has one little downside, which is really prone to error. Right, so it gets things wrong a lot. It's very biased. Um, and system two thinking is serial looped thinking. It's kind of metacognitive, it's systemic thinking. It's, it tends to be more based on evidence and informational feedback from the real world. And its downside is that although it's more accurate, it's a little slower. Well, a lot of what we do in our lab is we look at how can we, um, how can we get the best of these both worlds, right? So in a way, how could we start to develop a system three kind of thinking, which is something that's both fast and more accurate? Not right, like, you know, none of us are right all the time. No mental models are perfectly accurate, but to, be, to have higher probability of better predictions, better decisions, better being, being more in alignment, righter more of the time. Right. So that's really what we're what we study. And that's what, you know, a lot of our research gets into. And just as a just a very brief overview of our latest batch of research, I want to just highlight a couple of things that we have learned most recently, of course. Uh, one of our, our latest research study we did with graduate students at Cornell. And what we did is we actually conducted four separate experiments with the sample of 400 respondents per experiment. So there's 1600 people on this study. Each group of 400 were shown this simple image of a fish tank, and they were asked to describe what they saw. And they recorded their answers. And then we gave them a very short, almost one minute treatment on one of these underlying patterns of systems thinking. So one group learned about distinctions, one about systems, the other relationships, and finally perspectives. So they all had this short passage. And then after they read that passage, they were asked to then look at this image again and describe it after knowing <clears throat> that pattern. And what's really interesting is that sample of 1500 people, 1600 people showed with really high statistical significance. But if we actually focus on knowing these patterns of thinking, distinction systems, relationships and perspectives, we get interesting results. So what we see here is that with just that short treatment in only one of the patterns, the respondents significantly improved the complexity and robustness of their thinking. So if you just take that in for a second, they had a one minute exposure to one of these underlying patterns of thought, and we had these massive results across the groups. So you can imagine if we put all of our effort into teaching all four of these things across contexts and in different topics, age groups, whatever, that we would have really amazing results. So for example, when we say complexity of thought, we measured that based on some other research on language as an indicator of the complexity of people's cognition. And what we found is the answers that people gave after the treatment were more sophisticated, greater depth. Um, they saw more in the fish tank of what was you know, considered unseen after learning these patterns of thinking. Um, they could see things from different points of view more readily. In other words, their thinking was more systemic. It was more meaningful. Um, and, you know, that has great effects down the road. And so, you know, to summarize that, it, 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 what's remarkable about this, like Laura said, is it's just a one minute 
interaction, one minute treatment had these effects that you can see D, S, R, and P. And, and what gets me excited about, and, and Laura too, is, is with parenting, you have a lifetime of intervention, yes. right? Uh, as a parent, you can really be incredibly influential on your kids learning thinking. Uh, and, and, and the way we do that is with just these four simple rules. Yep. And each one of these rules is made up of two important elements. So distinctions are about identity and other systems are of parts and wholes. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go through examples. Relationships are comprised of action and reaction and perspectives are point and view. And this is important because one of the things that we know, people <laughs> commonly associate a perspective with the point, meaning my perspective is what I see and only what I see. But Perspectives are actually a relationship between the looker and the things being looked at, which means we can have many different lookers of the same thing and see completely different things based on perspective. So a lot of folks at first, when they hear these four rules, they think there's no way like thinking is so complex and so adaptive. And so, uh, you know, just think about the full range of human thought is, is pretty massive. How could it be sort of fundamentally based on just four rules. And, and it maybe seems at first to be quite, you know, you know, it doesn't connect. But if you think about it, um, there's a lot of research that shows that this is the case. But if you, if you just sort of think on the, you know, what you're exposed to level, there's a lot of things that are like this. If you think about our color system, all the images that you've ever seen uh, that are printed are printed using just four colors, C, M, Y, and K, and you can create an infinity of possible colors. If you think about Legos, I mean, they're so simple, but what can't you build with Legos, right? Like you can build a, you can build a taco, you can build a bridge, you can build a Volvo, you know, you can build anything. And if you think about a, a great movie, The Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi actually shows daniel son that all of karate and all of its adaptive kicks and moves and all that is really can be reduced to four underlying uh, movements, right? And DNA, right? The, the nucleotides A, T, C, and G, you mix and match those in different ways and you get a nose cell versus a hair cell. You get a platypus versus a giraffe. You get incredible diversity with just a small number of things that mix and match in a dynamic way. So the key to DSRP is not to think of them as steps. It's not you do D first and then S and then R and then P. And they're not like, they're very dynamic. If you take a perspective, it alters the distinctions. If you take a, uh, if you see a relationship, you can zoom in and see the part whole system that's inside the relationship and things like that. The four rules are really compounding on each other and mixing and matching with each other. And your brain's doing this all the time, whether you like it or not. And so DSRP is really fundamentally at the base. They're the simple rules that kind of mix and match. Chess is the same way as a game. You know, a real small set of simple rules or the game Go, very set of small set of simple rules, but you get lots and lots of diversity in terms of the games. So the point is, uh, whether, whether, you, whether you like it or not, real world systems, including your brain, organize information with DSRP. So you don't really get to choose if you use DSRP, you get to choose whether you're aware of and leverage that awareness um, to, to better understand your thinking and better understand the world. Does that make some sense? It's, it's a little bit like gravity. You don't get to choose whether gravity is happening to you, but you do get to choose to understand gravity and then you can do all kinds of things with it. So when we talk about um, mental models, how we're building meaning of things, we really are talking about the combination of the information and how we organize it. Organizing it, meaning thinking about it, encoding, Cognition is, a, is an act of organizing, structuring. DSRP are the building blocks of mental models. It's how we structure information to make meaning. And so when we look at this kind of thing, it's it, information and organization is what makes meaning. 
or what we call mental models. And so you can see, you know, the data itself, the information isn't really meaningful until we organize it in some way, maybe put it into a graph or a grid that, that, that has some meaning on the X and Y axis or something like that. And then all of a sudden that data has some meaning. Um, so we can show you a, a, a quick example of what we mean by the structure or the organization versus the content or the information. You know, if we read these two sentences, woman without her man is helpless or woman without her man is helpless, right? Those are the same informational content, but we get dramatically different meaning by organizing it differently. And the same with this one, for example, I like to eat grandpa or I like to eat grandpa, right? So the way we organize the information changes the meaning of the information. And so when you're thinking, this is critically important because when you're thinking about your kids, they are taking in information all the time. And information is all around us, much more so today than ever before. Because although information's around us in nature, now we all have access to Google. Information is readily available to us. Information is practically free and abundantly available. But how we organize that information, becoming an expert and fluid and adaptive and, and really good at organizing information to create meaning, that's the ball game. That's the whole ball game we call life. That's success in every dimension of success, no matter how you want to define success. If it, being good at something, feeling good about yourself, making money, whatever the, the what, however you want to define success, it's going to be about organizing information in various ways. And we also want kids to be aware of this relationship between how things are structured and how it brings meaning, because sometimes information is given to them <clears throat> already structured for them. And we want them to question how information is given to them. We want them to question the mental models that may be coming from a bias or an agenda at them, yep. for them to be able to decipher that and make, make decisions for themselves and not be easily manipulated. I mean, we talk about this with the internet All the and time. information. As parents, we it's, don't it's want important. our kids to be consumers of information. Yep. We want them to be builders of meaning, right? And so we want to give them that that critical tool or, or tool belt or tool chest or whatever you wanna, whatever metaphor you wanna use to be able to be a builder of meaning so that they can build the meaning that they need to build at the time when they need to build it in the situation, in the context. And many of these contexts are contexts that you can't dream of. You know, when I was a kid, all parents wanted their kids to be doctors, lawyers, or dentists, right? <laughs> Well, today there's much better jobs, you know, a lot of other jobs other than doctor, lawyer, and dentist that, that are good. So we can't foresee like the worlds that our kids are gonna go into. What we can foresee is that they definitely will need to organize information and create meaning in very sophisticated ways. And so if we give them that gift, those tools, they're gonna be okay. What we really want, and the reason we talk, the reason we started in schools yep. a long time ago, is with our own kids when they were, you know, in first grade, third grade, whatever grade, they would bring their homework home. We realized that the, <clears throat> the best thing we could equip them with was an, a, an understanding of how they think, how they think about any content. Because when you understand how you think, that means you can think anything, right? You can, you can have these big ideas. You can question ideas that are given to you. And it's just like this great tool set that we think, I mean, it's really kind of where the heart and soul of all of this started. <laughs> exactly. like we, want, we want people to understand their own mind and how they're coming to bring you know, meaning to the world so that they can use that as a tool set. So one of the questions we get a lot is how do you get good at systemic thinking or systems thinking or just thinking in complex ways about complex things? And the answer is not uh, profound. The, <laughs> the answer profound. is pretty basic. <laughs> the answer is you do reps and streaks. And 20 years ago, I wouldn't have said this. We, we, would, you know, we wouldn't have said immediately. We would have said, oh, you know, learn systems thinking, learn D and S and R and P, and then you'll know that, and then you go. But really... It's the part underneath it because you can learn DSRP in five minutes, 
uh, it's distinction systems, relationships, and perspectives, right? And then if you want to learn a little bit deeper, there's distinctions are identity other and systems are part whole and relationships are action reaction and perspectives are point and view. But that took what, two minutes to describe and, and basically you know what DSRP is. What's, what takes a little more time is what we call reps and streets, which is you gotta get repetition in, you gotta practice, you gotta see it all around you, it's everywhere. Um, and you gotta do it consistently over time, right? Just like anything else, the practice is gonna burn the neurons and it's gonna make your brain really good at traveling those pathways so that your brain kind of travels those pathways when just autonomically, it just does it really easily because the, the trails are built in your brain. So um, there, DSRP can do a lot of things. And, and if you mix and match DSRP, you can get like a, an infinite number of combinations. But if you wanna do like, get 80% of the benefit for 20% of the work, kind of a Pareto principle, then these five questions have come out of the research as being the most important five questions for thinking. Right, and so when we talk with teachers, we talk about, you know, we talk with parents, we've, we've done work with, with both groups for several years, you really can reduce it to anything that your child is thinking about you can ask them these structural questions to get them to be thinking more deeply and to learn how to think about the underlying structure of what they're thinking about. So it's simple, you know, it's what are the things I'm choosing to see? In and these are, these are on our website. You can download the PDF for free. So you don't have to scribble nervously them we down. Share. We share it all on our website for free. You just download yeah. it. Yeah. And you can, you can also obviously see that you would adapt the level of language of these questions based on, you know, if you're working with a kindergartner versus a grumpy executive, sometimes <laughs> you behave very similarly, yes. <laughs> depending. But so, you know, basically, what are the things I'm choosing to see and not see? That's, you know, what are the distinctions I'm making? How are these things grouped or not grouped? How are they related or not? The or not is always a good and important question to add into. And importantly, this uh, fourth question, do the relationships have parts? is a really key element of systems thinking and is a way to really extend the knowledge of kids, particularly beyond what's asked of them in school. So we have found in schools, generally speaking, that they focus on kids relating things, just like a line from a baseball to a bat on a worksheet, right? But what we really wanna do is just take it a little step further and say, how are these things related? Can you tell me more about it? Break it into parts. That's a deeper level of thinking that's actually, as you all know, kids are quite capable of. And you, we should be pushing them to think just a little bit more. And that's a key element of extending your thinking. And when we zoom into those relationships, that's where a lot of the detail of a system exists yes. inside the relationships between things. So what we call RDSs, which is a relationship that you distinguish and then systematize by looking at its parts, that is a critical way to really get a deeper understanding of systems of all kinds. Yeah. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to question perspective. And when we talk about perspective, there are a couple of things to remember that are important for systems thinking. One is that we want to push to have not just perspectives with eyeballs, but to take conceptual perspectives on things. And that we want to take multiple perspectives on anything that we're thinking about to get a better understanding of it and challenge that. Oh, here we go. We're going into practice. Yes. This is the whole thing about the tools, right? So uh, as we said, you know, think about the questions, but we also, we have created quite a few types of tools and techniques that you can use with kids that make it easier. So the first thing that we want to focus in on is, is that, you know, the first, the very basic thing that comes from those questions and that teachers and parents can learn is there is a way to language our thinking. There's a way for kids to understand how to think about things, but also how to articulate the way they're thinking about them. So just a quick story, you know, we were in a school in Fairfax County, Virginia, we were in a fifth grade classroom, the wonderful teacher named Miss Novak, and she was working on a, a lesson with one of her students and she kept saying, Johnny, I want you to think about this. I really want you to think about this. And she said it three or four times. And she said, finally, Johnny just said, 
I don't know what you mean. Like, what are you asking me to do? What do you mean for me to think about this? And so then she had the, she took the time to say, I want to understand how are you differentiating these things? How are you relating them? You know, that kind of question. And so they developed that common language about, around structural thinking. So just remember that we can start first and foremost with the way that we language things just in and of itself. And that we can make it very explicit, which is called metacognition. Yeah. And the research on metacognition shows it's very important, probably the most important thing. Make it explicit what thinking is. If we, say, if we just keep saying to a kid, think about it, but we never tell a kid what, what is thinking? What do we mean? Well, we mean distinguish between things, take a, a different perspective, yeah. relate things, yeah. group things in different ways. If we don't um, tell them that, they might, they might never learn that. They might get to, believe it or not, they might get to grad school at Cornell University <laughs> and still not know how to do it. We want to move from who, what, why, when to, you know, DSRMP. The other thing that's really um, a great benefit that we saw uh, often in our work in schools is that when you have this language for the way that you're thinking about things, how you're thinking about things, it actually will increase transfer for kids of any age. And um, our very favorite example, which I think is actually in the book, yeah. we were working with a kindergarten classroom uh, with a teacher named Ms. Callahan. And she, she was somebody who was really, really wanted to, you know, get these things embedded into her classroom and the curriculum. They had a lesson on community helpers so that the kids in the classroom could understand, you know, a policeman is there to help you, a fireman is there to help you, et cetera, et cetera. Part of the lesson is they bring a fire truck to the school. And before they did that lesson where they go out and look at the fire truck, she just taught them the idea of parts and holes. Just, just S of just DSRP. S. Just everything is a part of something. All of those parts have parts. Every, every hole's a part, every part's, oh, they made a song. They made a little song, yeah. Every hole's a part. Every part has a hole and every part can be a hole, basically is the, the three things they learned in like less than a minute. Yeah. So, um, so they went out and looked at the fire truck. And then what happens is they look at the fire truck, they talk to the firemen and they come back into the classroom. And the part of the lesson is they build a fire truck out of cardboard. And typically their models are a box and a wheel and something on the back, a ladder type thing, right? Yeah, they always, they do this every year and, and every year they get the same, the kids basically do the same, same thing. thing. They get the four wheels, yeah. the steering wheel, the front of the truck, the back of the truck and the ladder. Yeah. And they draw a picture of the truck and they build, like Laura said, they build it out of cardboard. They build the truck in the classroom. Yeah, so this, this particular year, they went in to build their fire truck and what she noticed was it didn't just have those sort of six or seven typical parts. The kids were putting more and more detail and more and more parts. So there'd be a latch for their door. There'd be noticeable rungs to the ladder. Then they would talk about, oh, we need something sticky to put on the ladder. Those parts. The grippy tape. The grippy tape because they noticed. So what you see is there were more and more parts because they knew to look for them. It wasn't just a steering wheel. Yeah. There were dials next to the steering wheel. They just saw more. They literally saw more. more. And they built, they engineered more. And they had words yep. for more. So they increased their language abilities. They increased what they, their seeing abilities. Mm -hmm. And this is just from learning a very simple idea of all. every hole has parts. Every part is a hole. Every hole could be a part of some larger hole. So instead of just seeing a ladder, they saw a ladder that had three parts to it. And then they saw that it has rungs. And then they saw that the rungs had tape and they broke it down and down and down. And just remember the fish tank, they learned one thing and they saw more in that tank. So we know that when you have awareness of these patterns, you actually, it changes what you see and how you do things. So I guess it was a month later, they went to later, yeah. an apple orchard, the same class who did the fire truck. They went to an apple orchard and they did a field trip and they were looking at apples and they sent us an email, which you got before me. And it said, yeah, dear Dr. Cabrera, doctors Cabrera, we, you came to our class and visited and we went to an apple orchard and we applied part whole. And we think we discovered 
a new undiscovered part of the apple. And we were hoping if you could check with any scientists at Cornell mm -hmm. to find out if we have in fact discovered a new part of the apple that nobody knows about. And we called the part the belly button and they showed me a picture of it, uh, which is a little fuzzy part at the top of the apple. They called it the belly button of the apple. So I called a, a, a geneticist and I said, you know, what is, the, what is this thing? And, you know, what's it, the scientific behind it? And it, it's actually called the calyx and it's part of the flower structure of an apple and then ends up in the, in the fruit part of the apple later on. So we said, well, you know, scientists do know about this, but you discovered it just like a scientist did and you named it. They named it calyx. You named it belly button. Either one works. Um, but they part hold the apple. They took the lesson from the fire truck and without even asking, they part hold the apple and discovered new things. Yeah. A new part. Yep. And then I guess it was a couple of months after that. We love this classroom. Yeah. A couple of months after that, um, unfortunately, they had a, a lockdown because there was an escaped prisoner in the area. So they had a lockdown of the school. This is a kindergarten classroom. So, you know, they followed the directions. They locked the door. They turn out the lights. They're quiet. They hide under their desks or in these back, these big back cabinets. And, you know, I would imagine for a, a small child, it's fairly unnerving. At the end of the lockdown, one of the little girls walked up to Miss Callahan and, you know, she was obviously upset about it. And she said, Miss um, Callahan, can we part hold the lockdown? And she told us, story. we both got, I still get chills when I say that story. Yeah. We're like, look at that. Like this girl knew that she did, she didn't have a, a sense or understanding of this thing that had just happened. And she knew the tool that she needed to deconstruct it and understand it. And it was the same thing she learned about fire trucks, the same thing she learned about apples. So you can see that crossing. I mean, that, that's called far transfer, which is re really the holy grail of learning is far transfer. Because when we teach somebody one thing and they have high far transfer, they can teach themselves 20 things. And what you're seeing there, if, if, if it's not entirely clear, is they learned something about a fire truck using a tool that literally cognitively helped them to take apart a fire truck. And then they use that same tool at an apple orchard and then used it again at a lockdown. And that's called far transfer. There's nothing similar about a fire truck or an apple orchard or a lockdown. So the information is kind of agnostic. The tool is helping them think through all different kinds of information. And that's what's powerful about it. Yep. Yeah, and I think also, you know, we could put the word parents in here as well as teachers. So when you learn DSRP versus you, when we, we compare teachers that were trained in DSRP, teachers that weren't, what we found was that, you know, those who weren't really sort of stayed in their, their mode of teaching to the test, whereas the other teachers really taught the thinking skills and didn't focus as much on the text. And what we found was that those who taught thinking rather than taught to the test actually over in the same year had higher scores on the tests than those who taught to the test. They actually all scored higher than average and had increases from year to year where the other group either stayed the same or decreased. So they not only got the benefits of thinking systemically, but they be did better on the test without teaching to the Which test. Which means they understood the content as well as you know the other group. And then we wanna talk a little bit for the last you know few minutes before we have time for questions about the different ways that we can um, concretize these ideas and teach them, you know, obviously uh, whiteboards, blackboards, there's softwares, there's tactile manipulative sync blocks, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Paper and pen, back of a napkin is one of our things. But all of which are for a purpose. And that is the brain, there's a, a guy called cortical humunculus. Slide, um, he looks like this, there you go. Which, is, which is that your brain, is hooked up to your eyes, your tongue, and your hands more than, more than the rest of your body. So anytime you can make things tactile, visual, or even uh, you know, on the tongue, um, the, the, the brain, that's speaking into the brain. Um, and so the reason we develop think blocks, the reason we develop systems mapping, the visual mapping, all these different types of, of mapping um, is simply because, and, or even using like you see down in the bottom right there, sugar packets and, and cashews and uh, what wasabi are those? Peas. Wasabi peas. You can build structural models with anything and you can make it tactile with anything. So 
we'll we'll talk a little bit about um, think blocks today because um, they're a really powerful tool uh, that I know some of you parents are using. So I want to take two seconds just to show you the basics of how we use them and then give you a, a ton of examples of ways that they've been used. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you hold that one. So they're dry erasable. I don't know if you can quite see that, but she just dry erased. So I'm going to make X. I can make a, um, a uh, this is idea X. This is idea Y. So each block is an idea. Now it's important. The one thing about blocks is they can only represent one idea. Don't write a bunch of. So we've ideas. distinguished one block from another. Yeah. So that's a distinction. They're, they're not the same. And here we can have, we have this other block is a part of Y. There's a part of X. And look, those parts have smaller parts. They can have parts. So we put those in there and you can label any one of these. You can obviously do that. And then here's what's really important. Then I can take another block, put those together. And that's the relationship. This block is acting as the relationship between these two ideas. So if it's mom and dad, the relationship between mom and dad to some kids is them, the child or marriage or any concept. And you now, can actually put parts into that. What are the parts of marriage? Love, a house, a dog. So what you see is the, the actual nature of handling and moving these ideas and labeling them makes them really object oriented and tactile. And that's the point of the blocks. You can also, just as a side note, take any block, put an eyeball on it and name it as a perspective, like from the perspective of the law, what is marriage? Well, it's a contract, right? It's a license, it's a this or it's a that. Now, here's an example of, you know, you can model these blocks in any way, shape or form, like here's the number line. And you can see that all of those greater than signs or less than signs are the relationships between the numbers on the number line. So every number has a relationship to every other yep. um, on, the, on the whole number line. Or you can think about the relationships of division as being a, a relationship and the relationships of the operators. So you can build equations with them. Mm -hmm. um, you can distinguish all kinds of things like things like needs and wants or equation versus expression, which is a distinction kids have trouble with, yeah, right? Right. which is an expression is exactly like an equation, except it doesn't have an equal sign yeah. um, or ethical versus legal, that type of stuff. So here's like you can build out. You don't always have to put them inside. The parts can be splayed out in mm -hmm. front of the uh, whole. So, you know, an equation has variables and operators and it's got, um, but it has an equal sign as part of the operators, whereas an expression can be exactly the same, variables and operators, but it just doesn't have an equal sign. So that's why kids get it confused because it's really, they're almost exactly the same, except one has equal and one doesn't. But you can see that object orientation of the blocks makes it incredibly clear and it makes it and actually creates more memory because of the neurons that are firing because of that tactile nature of the lesson. They'll never forget it once they build it. Yep. And then, you know, like I just said, mom and dad, what well, the relationships, that's a simple lesson they do in, in kindergarten versus up to chemistry, the, less, the, the types of relationships between solids and liquids and gas. And one of the great things about, about DSRP and think blocks and all this kind of stuff is you can see there that we just have a two-way relationship between solid and liquid and liquid and gas. But again, you can zoom into that relationship and you can, with DSRP and blocks, you can build out that relationship as to whatever level of sophistication, which means that you might build a model like this, a simple model when you're in you know, grade school, but that same simple model, just with more zoom in, more complexity, you're still using in high school or college, yeah. right? So it's not that the model becomes wrong, you just keep building on it and making it more, um, more specific, zooming in, things like that. Yep, and then if you look, like we were saying, you can, you can mix other tactile objects in the classroom. This one classroom, we're trying to distinguish between uh, animals from different parts of the world and they literally have little statues and they sorted them out using the blocks from so you can see the perspective over there where from yep. where are these animals from and then the kid sorts them in terms of africa not africa so they're making a distinction 
based on a perspective. And by the way, that distinction, Africa, not Africa, is a part whole system. So you can see how dynamical things are that when you take a perspective to make a single distinction, you're actually creating two part whole systems. Yeah, yeah. And then the one on the right is, uh, I just wanted to use that to show you that people, people can take stickers and images and gra you know graphics and literally attach them to the blocks. In this case, this one teacher used uh, double-sided tape so you can embed other kinds of materials you have. And then finally, um, in terms of lesson examples, one of the things you can do is you can take pretty sophisticated content and you can literally embed as part of an existing lesson, just the idea of the physical model. So this is saying, this is an existing piece of curriculum uh, in a project we did for uh, USDA where they had a really good curriculum, but they just didn't know how to kind of concretize those abstract ideas. So they just literally had the kids build a physical model of those ideas. And there's one question that, that you have trouble getting. Uh, you can get them in India, think blocks, but, but they are not easy to get to India. So I understand it. But this picture is sort of showing you um, I could build this with think blocks. See this thing down in the bottom right here? I could build that with think blocks, three think blocks, medium blocks with, with relational blocks in between and then smaller blocks. But look, I, I also built it with sugar packets, cashews and wasabi peas, right? This is actually the structure of the three parts of the government, uh, the US government, the legislative branch, the judicial branch and the executive branch and then what are the relationships between them uh it's it's the balance of, of checks and balances so there's two p's one is checks and mm -hmm. one is balances so you can build it with anything you don't have to have think blocks think blocks are nice to have because they're dry erasable and they do some fun stuff but you can literally build it you know with anything that is around you you can just get blocks you can get sugar packets you can take scraps of paper, but as soon as you make those tactile, it makes a huge difference for the, for the human brain and for teaching. And if you want to scroll to the goal thing, the slide is the goal, yeah. and then we're done with this part. We can just take questions. I mean, the point of all of this is the goal is that you use this object orientation to get kids thinking structurally when they don't necessarily have to have the tactile manipulatives, right? So for example, we did research with a uh, parents many years ago. And one of the things that uh, a parent reported to us after working with the blocks to teach her son some ideas was eventually, not too long, like a month into it, they were driving home from school and he said, hey, I had this really hard problem in uh, math today. I didn't have the blocks with me. So I just did the blocks in my head. And like a really good example, which also gives you a cute picture of our son 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, was, you know, he was doing this when he was helping us undo the groceries. He was saying, okay, this thing goes in the fridge. This thing doesn't go in the fridge. And he was just doing that in his head and separating things into different counters. Different so part whole systems, yep. making a distinction between different part whole systems based on the perspective fridge, not fridge, right? Yep. Yep. And I think, you know, I think if you wanted to close on one thing is uh, one of your most, I put your famous quote <laughs> up on a slide, which is when you see the kids thinking, you're actually really seeing the child. You're, you're seeing how they're building meaning and knowing their thoughts. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, 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 that's a really important idea that when you see your child's thinking, you're actually seeing your child. You can't see your child truly if you don't see your child's thinking and understand how they're thinking and DSRP is really powerful because it, it helps you understand wrong thinking just as well as it helps you understand right thinking. It, any kind of thinking, any mental model will be structured using DSRP. So it, it helps you understand when they're thinking about things in kind of a, a skewed or strange way or a different way. Um, and you want, to, you want to move them towards a, a new way of thinking about it. You can kind of compare and contrast that new mental model to the current and, uh, and move them along the way, which yeah. is fundamentally what teaching and learning is. Yeah. So yeah. at this point, I think we'll just, we, I know we, we're almost over, maybe even over time, but no, we we're happy to stay on um, and answer any questions you have, just come off your mic and, or you can type them in the uh, chat if you don't wanna. Dan has his hand up. Yeah, Dan. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, doctors. I wanna just ask 
about uh, the think blocks and the VMCL capacity and how you could demonstrate that. Great question. We, we actually, with executives, do this all the time when we're working with executives. We'll get a big table and we'll build their VMCL out of blocks. Um, and it's very powerful. And some of the things you see are shocking and surprising, which is that the, the group gets less hung up on the terminology because a block represents an idea. And so they'll just talk about, oh, what, what, what happens when this thing affects this thing? And so they're arguing less about what the words are and focusing more on what the meaning is, you know, and, um, and, and they're able to do it much quicker because they can point to the physical structures and they can move them around and they're, they explore more. It's not about like there's a right way or a wrong way. They go, what would happen if we move this thing over here and did this, you know? And so it just becomes a much more sort of like creative, um, flexible, fluid process with them. And it's very powerful to watch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful because I, I could see that in a leadership development in a classroom, um, especially for like a student government um, role. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Great, yeah, great discussion. Along those lines, I mean, people think of blocks as children's tools, but it's not true at all. I, I actually think that the more complex the content, the more tactile we should get, the more uh, risk that we have, the more tactile we should get. So in, in many ways, these things that we think of as toys, which they're not, uh, or play, like blocks we think of for kids, they're actually incredibly helpful for adults. And especially when things are very, very complex, you need to get that stuff out of your head because your head will play all kinds of tricks on you. The more complex things get, the more overlap and things like that. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Are there other, uh, let's see, in the case of neurodiverse learners, can you use systems thinking for abstract concepts of language, socialization, emotions, et cetera? Do the concepts generalize to real life scenarios? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a real value in, in bringing some of those abstract concepts to make them less abstract by making them physical um, and, and making them tangible. So um, even things like when we were, when, when our kids were younger, we would do like, you know, we'd do like dinner, let's say, as an example. And we'd say, well, what one of our kids used to say, well, I'm finished with dinner. Can I, can I go do something? And we'd say, well, wait a minute. What are the parts of dinner? Well, the tangible part of dinner is that you're eating, right? So kids think when I'm done eating, I'm done with dinner. But there's some intangibles, right? There's love, there's conversation, there's all that kind of stuff, manners. Uh, that's part of dinner too. So we used to build at our table, which is dry erasable so that we can draw and build with think blocks. And we have a centerpiece of think blocks on our diner table. Um, and we used to build a, a structural thing with four parts. And we'd say, well, dinner's made up of four parts. You might be done with eating, but are you done with manners? Are you done with love? Are you done with um, conversation? And, you know, because there's a lot of research that says the dinner table is the, is, place. Is the place to parent. Uh, it's a, it's, if you eat dinner together, your kids are going to just be much better off. Uh, the mm -hmm. research shows that in the long run. Yeah. So if you make dinner more about more than just eating, if you make it about conversation, if you make it about love, and, and if you help them build that concept, pretty soon they'll go, hey, dad, you know, we didn't really have uh, much, uh, you know, conversation or you're not, or excused, yet. You're not <laughs> excused yet, you know, or whatever. And they'll start calling you on it because they'll have built that model. Yeah. For sure. So even those sort of intangibles, you can make tangible. Yep. Thank you. That answered the question. Thank you. Will there be a possibility to see the recording again? You mean the recording for this talk? Uh, yes, we will. We will post the recording of this talk. And one clarification, um, which Raman just, uh, Dr. Raman just told me about uh, is that you can get uh, think blocks in India. I mean, it takes a, l a little bit to get them there, but, um, but you can actually get them in India, so. Yes. 
Other questions? Did we answer all the ones in we the text? We did answer the text. Now it's up to people to speak up. Yes. So I had a, a quick comment, uh, just following up on the pink blocks. Uh, and one of the things we really did with pink blocks uh, was also use it for storytelling, because uh, especially when, you know, with neurodiverse learners, a lot of them do have language challenges. Yeah. And so uh, when we put things on the pink blocks, we would uh, pair it with uh, gestures. And uh, it was really easy to build in prepositions and things like that when you sort of uh, using gestures and moving blocks around much more easily than if you just uh, even drew it on a piece of paper. So I think uh, yeah. the tactile uh, element did add to that. Yeah, I love that example, storytelling. And one of my favorite things uh, that we've been a part of doing is actually creating a story table yeah. where you create a little table somewhere in your room or the where, wherever you are. And as you're reading something, and, and that something might not be read all at once, it might, you might be reading a book over the course of weeks, you build a model of the book. So as a new character enters, the, you add a character to the table and you add relationships between the characters. And, um, and one of the cool things that you can do with that model is you can start to get kids to think beyond what the author wrote, which is a big part of reading. So you can say to them, you know, the author didn't write about uh, this character and how they would feel about this situation that happened. They wrote about these other characters and how they felt. But how do you think, based on what you know of this character, how do you think they would feel about the situation if they knew about it? So you can actually get the kid to start thinking beyond the book and to start building almost a, a four-dimensional or a multi-dimensional understanding of the characters and the book and the story and the purpose of it all, um, which is what good readers do, right? They, they, they can sort of method act the, the different characters and take their perspective, even on things that aren't literally in the book. Yes, yeah, Cesar, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, you know, we use think blocks with our doctoral students, graduate students, and we use them with, with kindergartners. Um, so it really is a, and we use them with executives and yeah. politicians and all kinds of other people. So um, really a very powerful tool yeah. across the age spectrum. Mm -hmm. Other questions that you have or thoughts or curiosities? I like that. Curiosities is good. <laughs> no. You're welcome. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, right. thank you. Thanks for showing up on a Saturday and, and hearing about it. And um you know, always, if you go to our website, there's a little thing in the bottom right hand corner. If you ever need any help, just go to that thing and say, hey, I, I have a question. We're always happy to, there's always somebody that will help you out and get you the answers you need or point you in the right direction to, to free resources and things like that. So yeah. um, we're, we're really committed to 7 billion systems thinkers. Yeah. So uh, we need your help in, in getting there because that's a lot. It's going to take a while for us. <laughs> and thanks again to Rama, uh, Dr. Rama for, um, uh, for, for setting this up and for doing all the work that she's been doing over the last 15 years. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, joining us. I, I really do think that there's a lot of opportunity for you know, putting DSRP and think blocks in the hands of parents. The uh, challenge in the school environment is always limited time, but with parents, you can always, you know, do it slowly over a period of time. So I think that's a huge advantage. Yes, I agree. And we, uh, we are looking forward to, you know, actually, I think getting back to more parents and teachers and we've sort of been 
all over, but I would like to focus back in on that a bit. And then people are asking for the website. The website is cabreraresearch.org, uh, cabreraresearch.org. I just put it in the uh, chat. Yeah. And there's lots and lots of free stuff there, uh, free resources. There's also trainings and other things and books, but there's um, all kinds of stuff that people can uh, get access to all of our papers and blah, blah, blah. More than you want. Way more than you, than you need. Too much stuff. Do we do any specific work? To, uh, we do. I, I'm actually uh, on the spectrum and, and, and have ADHD. So that's one of the um, uh, things that, that I'm very focused on uh, and very interested in. Um, it's why I love the work that Dr. Rama has been doing for 15 years. Um, so uh, we, we do a lot of that. Those are all thank yous. Doing a great job. Okay, yeah. good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, it's always the best thing to hear that that your work is having a good positive impact. So we appreciate it. Share. We we always like to hear what what you're up to and what things you're seeing and uh, successes you're having or or troubles that you're having because perhaps we can help you resolve those. Um, so we're always here. Be don't be shy. Just check in with us. We'd love to hear from you. Yep. Thank you for your time. Thank you, weekends. everyone. It's good to see you. I will send the uh, the link to the the video when we post it to to Dr. Rama. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. What's the time?